So, hello everybody. I'm Aaron Cray, and I'm here to talk about most batching, subclassing, and accidental mesh overriding. So where I'm coming from here is, suppose you're working on some software, which uses a third-party class. Maybe it's open source, maybe it's commercial software, it doesn't matter for these purposes. One day you think to yourself, hmm, wouldn't it be nice if this class had some more methods? It would make it a bit better with what I'm trying to do. Now, there are broadly two basic ways of accomplishing that. One is to subclass the third class of class and just add some new methods in the subclass. The other option, at least for dynamic languages, is to just stuff the methods you want into the existing class, what's known as monkey patching. And any of you who've been down that road before, you're probably already cringing right now, but it's apparently a popular approach, at least in some quarters. Let's take a relatively well-known example of where people have done just that. So in 2008, um, Ruby on Rails uh, added a new method to strings called chars, which returns what they call a multi-byte safe version of the same string. I don't know what that means, but they apparently do. But then in August of that year, Ruby 1.8.7 came out, and they'd added a completely different method of the same name to strings intended to let you iterate over the characters of the string. So you can say some string dot child dot max will give you the biggest of the characters of the strings. So when people using the Rails version of Charles upgraded their version of Ruby from 1.8.6 to 1.8.7, all their apps stopped working. And at the time the consensus response to problems like that was, oh you should always use subclassing and never use monkey patching. Sadly, as I'm going to show, that response has two problems. First, it can be way more effort among patching, especially for things like the Ruby case of patching the standard string class in the language. I'll come back to that issue later on. But more importantly, it doesn't actually solve, solve the problem. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the Perl module Tibix class, which I am, by the way, a huge fan of. Suppose you've got a database of books, and you want to count how many distinct authors there are. In plain old Divix class, that might look like this. So you say, oh, from the schema, find a results set of books, and do a search, which extracts just the columns, but the distinct ones, and then you count the things you get back from there. Now that's kind of quite a lot of code for something relatively simple. And it, in particular, it has the annoying feature that you hide the count method call at the end of something pretty long. So eventually you hit on the idea of writing a method to simplify that. Count distinct, you say. You say schema, results set, book, and just count the distinct author IDs. Much nicer. So being a well-behaved sort of a programmer, you write a subclass which does nothing but add that method. So we declare our, our new subclass. It inherits from the base, the mixed class, result set, and we just add our method, which does the obvious thing. And then you do you jump through whatever hoops are necessary to make sure that your subclass gets used in all the appropriate places, and you write your tests, and you make sure they all pass, and then you decide your work here is done. Wonderful. Well, sort of. Suppose sometime later, the sysadmins keeping your app running decide it's time to upgrade to this class. Now, mostly you can expect that to go pretty smoothly because the Divix class developers do a fine job and they have pretty good test coverage, but you can't guarantee it. Suppose, in particular, in this hypothetical world, the Divix class developers have also been annoyed by the inconvenience of counting distinct columns, and they've added their own method with a slightly different API. Perhaps their version takes any number of columns, not just one. And when you upgrade to this version, of course, the tests for your version of count distinct still part because everything your method handles is also handled by the new Divix class version. And of course, the tests for the new version of Divix class itself also pass because when they get run, your code hasn't even been loaded. But suppose further that this new version of Divix class also includes another method which invokes count distinct with multiple column names somewhere in its implementation. So if that method gets invoked on a plain Divix class result set, everything's going to be fine. But if it gets invoked on an instance of your subclass, you silently get the wrong behavior. That is, no matter how much work you went through to create a subclass, rather than just monkeying your method into the existing class, you still made things break. 
And this can be ha expected to happen in pretty much any programming language, including languages that are much less dynamic than Perl. All it takes for you is to <coughs> all it takes for you to take a third-party class, subclass it with extra methods, then later on a new version of the third-party class adds a method of the same name and uses it somewhere in its own implementation. So in effect, the distinction between the two versions of the third-party class allows for a, a peculiar sort of temporal dynamism. Even if you have static method name lookup in your language, you've effectively got two versions of the class because they were written at different times. But the great thing about Perl compared to less powerful languages is that we can find a way to fix it. So, we want to prevent this sort of accidental overriding, but how do we do it? It would seem absurd to directly legislate against overriding methods in derived classes. I mean, that's pretty much the pointer of, of inheriting and overriding methods, right? So, let's look at the various cases. So, the simplest thing is you define a method in a class with no superclasses. Um, package base has a method called m1. And obviously, we want to think that that's a reasonable thing to do. Similarly, deriving a class from that and adding a new method, that's also fine. M2, not defined in base, we're fine. And it's also fine to write a derived class method which knows about the base class version, because clearly that can't be accidental. So if our derived 2 class inherits from base and has a new method M1, which uses next method to delegate back to the original, then clearly the programmer knew what they were doing. The tricky case is something like this. We've got our derived 3 class, which inherits from base, and it's got another method called M1, and we can't tell whether that was deliberate or accidental overriding. There just isn't enough information there to work out whether this M1 override is deliberate or accidental. And for that matter, even with the M1 in derived 2, uh, which uses next method to extend the behavior of the base class version, it's quite hard to observe from the outside that that's what you're trying to accomplish. So it seems that we need more precision in describing our classes. And of course, it turns out that some object systems give you just that. So, Moose, for example. Moose builds on um, the class mod meta object protocol to give you method modifiers. So it would let you, for example, write the derived to example, which modifies the inherited method, like this. So we say derived to is a moose class, which extends the base class. And instead of writing a new M1 method, we say, oh, before the M1 method we were going to run, we just do something else first. So that's clearly going to be OK. Um, so there's similarly an after modifier, which you know, lets you run a piece of code after the base class method. And there's a round, which is a bit like combining the two with some extra complexity. And there's also an override method modifier, which simply replaces the inherited method. So in drive 3, we can say that M1 overrides whatever M1 did in the inherited version. And of course, these method modifiers, they're exactly what we need for distinguishing deliberate and accidental overriding. You can decide that you'll reserve the plain sub blah syntax for defining methods that you don't expect to exist in your superclasses, and that you'll always use the Moose method modifiers when you do want to deliberately override or, or extend a method. And once you've done that, it's possible to programmatically detect accidental overriding by interrogating the mod. Comes out in just a moment. But you also may find that the discipline of relying on these method modifiers actually makes your code clearer before or override are much more precise statements about what you're doing than the equivalent implemented with next method. So how do we write this code that determines whether a method has been implicitly overridden? So let's start with a function named check class, uh, takes a class name's argument and throws an exception if that class overrides any method in its inheritance graph other than using an explicit method modifier. So check class, we find all the methods directly in the in dollar check e, and for each one, we see whether it's been implicitly overridden. And if there are any that have been over implicitly overridden, we throw an exception. <coughs> so the heavy lifting is done by this function 
implicitly overridden in the middle of the grep there. So here's a sample implementation. It might not be completely bulletproof, but it should be a good proof of concept for what I'm trying to demonstrate. <coughs> so we take a meta object representing a class, and the name of a method which might be defined in that class, <coughs> excuse me. So we then find a meta object representing the method of that name, or if there isn't one, we bail out. <coughs> and then we say that the, the method has been implicitly overridden if there's an inherited method of the same name and the locally defined method wasn't defined using a method modifier. So we have this list of class names which represent method modifiers. It's a little bit clunky, but as I say, serves as a proof of concept. So with this code, it's quite easy to put together a pragma-like module that lets individual classes opt into this, this sort of checking. And in practice, you do want checking to be opt-in so that you can add it piecemeal to an existing class hierarchy. So the idea is that a class which wants this error checking can say, use explicit overrides, <coughs> and guaranteed to get a compile time error if it accidentally overrides any base class methods. So how do we implement explicit overrides? Well, we'll declare our package. Um, we're going to make things do the work at import time. All we do at import time is we make a note of the name of the class so that we can investigate it later. And then at check time, or something appropriate, check is immediately before the main program starts executing. We run all the necessary checks on all the classes that have asked for it, and there we go. So at this point, we can feel pretty pleased with ourselves. We apply just a little discipline when writing our classes, and a couple of dozen lines of code in a module. And now we can guarantee that upgrading to an incompatible version of the base class will cause a compile time error. But of course, remember the other problem with using <coughs> subclassing instead of monkey patching. It can be really awkward to make sure your subclass is used everywhere appropriate. And that's especially true in situations like the Ruby string chars method. You want that new method to be available on ordinary string literals and on arbitrary strings returned by other pieces of code. <coughs> So Perl offers overload constant to help with the string literals bit of that. But it doesn't really help you when you're looking at extending one specific class buried in the middle of a large system of cooperating classes, like with Dibbix class result set. So can we do something similar for monkey patching? Well, it turns out that's actually easier. Because we're just dropping a method into a class, we don't actually need a mock to work out whether the class already has a method of that name. So let's look at how we might want override safe monkey patching to work. We might say something like this. <coughs> Use monkey patched Dibbix class result set and some set of methods. So it's a new pragma-like module called monkey patched. It takes a class name and a hash from method names to code refs. And we want it to load the class and then inject the code refs uh, into that class under the appropriate names. But if the class already has access to some method of the name in question, it should throw an exception. And implementing this is pretty easy. <coughs> so, package monkey patched. Again, we're doing our work at import time. We load the module, we go through each method. If the target already can do that method name, then we throw an exception. Otherwise, we install the subroutine. And installing the sub install sub, that's exactly what you'd think. Names the code ref appropriately using the sub name, and then inserts it into the appropriate package. And I'm actually using an unpublished version of this class, of this code rather, in production at my company. And I really like it. I like the fact that it can trivially inject methods into existing classes without me having to find ways of writing suitable subclasses and get them used in all the right places. But I can still sleep soundly at night in the knowledge that this monkey patching is safe, even if one of my dependencies is upgraded incompatibly. The error always happens at compile time, so just trying to load my code will fail, which means I can be certain my test will fail. And of course, I'd never upgrade anything on a live server without running my tests under the new version on a dev box first. 
So the, sub the conclusions from all this are perhaps a little surprising. First, it's a little odd to find that subclassing is actually no safer than monkey patching. And even though they're both dangerous, if done with care, a sufficiently dynamic and flexible language lets you make both of them entirely safe. So much for the alleged danger of monkey patching. Thank you. So I'm going to get some uh, detailed notes on this topic added to my website in the next day or two. But in the meantime, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'll give the one that's been published. Um, no, um, explicit override doesn't actually exist. I, I have this proof of concept thing. I'm not sure how it will work in practice. I think I'd need to speak to the Moose and Plasmop developers to see what they think about it. Um, monkey patched, no, but I believe that is safe and I probably should get around to see panning it very soon. Maybe that'll have to be in the next couple of days as well. Um, given that monkey patching is seen as a derogatory term in some quarters, but like your safe monkey patching, should you acquire a different animal as the buzzword you use and call it gorilla patching or something? That's, uh, that's the question is, should we call it something less derogatory than monkey patching? Um, I don't know what the, the better name would be for this safe monkey patching. I mean, there are, of course, other names for monkey patching already. So the, the term originally comes from Guerrilla patching, as in guerrilla warfare, which then got reinterpreted as guerrilla in terms of ape, and then monkey patching. Um, also heard it called duck punching in the sense that if it doesn't walk and talk like the duck you expect, you keep punching it until it does. <laughs> um, but yes, I'll take suggestions for, for better names for safe monkey patching. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you very much.